welcome, welcome. This is an episode of Getting Real. Uh, we have two incredible guests with us, uh, Roger, Head of Digital Assets at Franklin Templeton, and AJ, who is Offchain Labs CSO. Uh, I'll let you guys give a brief instruction and we can take it from there. How about start with you, Roger? Sure, Roger Baston. I head Digital Assets at Franklin Templeton. Sometimes I tell people that being head of Digital Assets at this juncture is like saying you're head of the internet department. Um, we're super excited about how this technology is transformative, transformative for the business uh, that we're in and the opportunities that we see going forward. And so, you know, we expect the, the digital asset department just to permeate um, a lot of things that we do um, in asset management and capital markets. So that's Roger. Perfect. Hey, AJ from the Offchain Labs team, been leading growth business development within the Arbitrum ecosystem out of Offchain Labs for about four years now. Uh, really excited to see the continued evolution of, you know, participants in blockchain technology and, have, you know, working with Franklin Templeton is a great example of um, where we're going from where we've started and really excited to have this conversation. Yeah, building off that, we have a, uh, a major announcement. Um, Franklin Templeton has announced Franklin's on-chain U.S. government money fund is available on our trim. Uh, this is marks the first L2 integration, and we're really excited about this. Uh, Roger, could you share more about the Benji platform and how, uh, yeah, how that works? Yeah, uh, several years ago, we were, uh, Franklin Templeton, we just began to think about how uh, distributed ledger technology, um, blockchains could be used in our business. And we had this crazy idea of bringing a a money fund construct, which is pretty simple um, and has stood the test of time for investors, large and small, literally all over planet Earth. There are trillions and trillions of dollars in money fund constructs. And uh, we thought, hey, how do we bring this this really interesting new technology to bear on that business? And um, lo and behold, we, we found some solutions of how we could use blockchains pretty effectively. And as we started doing our research and development and our kind of proof of concept, it, it just, the efficiency gains just unfolded in front of us and were super impressive. And as a result of that, we're like, we just keep piling in and doing more and more things. Um, that was an environment where interest rates were at the front part of the yield curve were zero. Um, you know, all these years later, they are an attractive place. So we like to think of Benji um, the kind of nickname that we use for our tokenized money fund has had an opportunity to ride on these new rails as as we integrate blockchain into all sorts of different transaction platforms moving forward. And so we saw ARB as a as a just a really great platform to be able to build towards. We've been working on this for a period of time and working with our friends at the SEC to get, you know, ARB on kind of a, the 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 list of networks that meet our uh, criteria to, to do this type of activity. And so we're glad that today is here for all of the different months and quite frankly, years of work that we had toward this. And so we're super excited. High five to both teams for getting there. Yeah, no, tremendous. It's been a, a high bar to clear and obviously working with you guys, you guys have such a storied history, I think uh, so much experience expertise when it comes to managing funds uh we're we're really happy that you're bringing that expertise over into arbitrum um but I, if i could just jump in for a second it must be like a crazy experience getting something like that internally like you know all that buy-in and everything like i'm curious what that journey was like because it's like so forward thinking um you know especially you know maybe today it's becoming more of a consensus conversation but three years ago like this must have been like an amazing battle not in like a, you know, provocative way, but just like in a, you know, education way internally. Great point, AJ. And I think it really, as, as other, um, as other just groups, entities, businesses, industries begin to explore how they may be able to use public blockchains, you know, inside of their operations. We're super fortunate that um, Jenny Johnson, who is our CEO, had spent lots of years inside of the operations Franklin Templeton building the operations. And when we started doing our proof of concept and uh, began to flirt with the idea that we could put transaction records for shareholders, we have 
transfer agency responsibilities in issuing securities of, of maintaining records for shareholders forever, quite frankly. You know, where we see these public blockchains as um, just great new technologies to house this type of business purpose for us. And so Jenny understood right away the use case of this and just kept encouraging, evangelizing. I don't know if any of you guys had a chance to to meet with her or hear her speak as well. She's pretty passionate about the opportunities that exist here. So I think it starts there, AJ. You have to have the right leadership and open-mindedness. But And then you quite frankly, when you're dealing in the public security space, boy, you have to have some resilience and persistence with your friends in the um, – in the regulatory space to help bring them forward and educate them that it's not about the cryptocurrency, but it's about the environment. And is it an improvement of the environment that actually increases the outcomes for all the stakeholders, especially the shareholders experience? And I think we've been able to do that. So um, yeah, it's been a, a great, it's been a great journey, but it doesn't end here, quite frankly, right? These are the thing type of things that, that um, solidify the opportunities that go forward. And so we're looking forward to not just keeping moving, you know, Benji forward in this space, but what are the other types of services that we can come to bear um, in using uh, things like Arbitrum as a backbone for, for what we're doing? Yeah, and I, I've heard Jenny speak uh, multiple times at CNBC and all that. I really think what stood out is like, she really calls blockchain as a disruptive technology, right? And I think that's, that's, that stuck with me because, you know, what we're building here is just the rails for you guys to launch things and for others to launch things. So I think that's, uh, that really keys into what we're doing. Uh, maybe. When you, what, can I, can I, I'm yeah. going to build on that a little bit because uh, you talk about being disruptive. In this case, it's disrupting the legacy technology that underpins all of these services of trust. Right. And so like our, in our business, it's all about trust. You know, investors hand over their money, quite frankly, you know, and put it in our hands because they trust, A, we're going to deliver what we what they expect and B, that they're going to, that's going to be there, right? We're in the business of trust. And we see the network that you're building, one word that we use is trustware, quite frankly, that underpins. And so, yes, it's disruptive. Our, our, the the outcome that the user still gets is a money market fund and they get their returns from investing in, you know, the short part of the curve and, and government assets and T-bills. So that stays the same, but boy, does it disrupt everything that sits underneath there. Um, improves, quite frankly, you call it disrupts, but we think improves is, is really the outcome that we're looking for. Yeah, no, completely agree. Completely resonates with me. Uh, and that kind of tees up my next question. I was going to ask you, what are the benefits of using blockchain technology for Benji? Uh, and have there been any operational efficiencies that you might have felt that really you know, worked well on blockchain? Yeah, I kind of alluded to that already, but I can just be very specific. These these records management that we are um, obligated to do um, and and do and have done for 76 years now, those the idea that these monolithic centralized databases built on technology from you know 20 years ago um, we think this is a, a a new and improved more resilient and quite frankly more creative space allowing more utility for the underlying savers who have products that are built on top of this so there are absolutely efficiency gains the cost of running those centralized monolithic databases um that are built on legacy technology that needs to continue to be maintained. Uh, the the public blockchain networks um, arbitrum that you're that you're building and ha and have built present um, significant operational efficiencies for us. That was that was the big light bulbs for us. Not just in saying okay, we need to be working increasing our resources toward this end to developing the operational efficiencies, but also just the idea that um, that these 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 networks and the assets that represent the networks, the tokenomics of the networks are also something that's going to continue to expand. So we want to offer advice about those as well. It's really been several things that have flowed from seeing the operational efficiencies because it doesn't take too much level one, level two thinking to realize that we have records management, but the entire economy, the data economy has record management uh, 
purposes and requirements. And so the um, we see lots of use cases unfolding in front. As do you, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think, you know, one of the things about settling this record keeping to Albertrim, I think highlights this with us is the scalability. AJ, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, can you share a bit more about fees on Arbitrum as an L2, you know, this marks first roll up integration that Franklin's done, how the fees work on Arbitrum, what's the makeup of that, uh, and how has it been since the EIP 444 Duncan upgrade, uh, and how might that benefit banks? Yeah, definitely. So I think the fundamental principle of the technology we're trying to build is how do we get fees down for the user experience to be better and continue to add scale. Like those are the two main focuses that we have, you know, obviously for people who have used the Ethereum network before, um, the, uh, the analog equivalent I would say is like sending wires. It's like, it costs 20 bucks. It's a little bit cumbersome. It's slow, but you know, people tend to use it when they have like super high value or super important transactions, like buying a house or something like that. Um, but it ultimately doesn't scale in the overwhelming majority of cases and it can't handle a lot of throughput by design. So Arbitral is built on top of it to be able to act as sort of like traditional rails um, for scalability and, and bringing prices down. When we launched about three years ago, we're almost at our three year anniversary of the Arbitrum launch. Transaction fees were, you know, on average around, you know, 50 cents to a dollar, which was super high. If you fast forward to today, August, 2024, typical transaction is sub penny on Arbitrum, right? So we're talking about, you know, two orders of magnitude improvement um, over three years. A lot of that has to do with, you know, advanced compression, advanced technologies that we've developed for the Arbitrum protocol, which happy to dive into, but might be sort of beyond the scope of what we're trying to accomplish here. And also um, some updates that Ethereum has made to make rollups or these L2s like Arbitrum have the ability to have, um, you know, cheaper settlement costs to Ethereum. And, you know, the combination of those two things has really driven the costs down of using the network. And it's been incredible to see. And, you know, moving forward, I think, you know, cost is probably less of a, a priority at this point in terms of like, you know, sub penny transactions, you know, typically works, but um, now it's about scalability. How do we take this from a platform where you have a million daily active users to 10 million daily active users to hundred million daily active users and being able to maintain sort of those cost components while being able to do that. So that's, I would say, you know, the next scaling challenge that we're trying to tackle and confident in the team that we're working with that, you know, we're going to be able to conquer that too. Yeah. I think, uh, bringing on board, uh, the next billion users, whatsoever is definitely a huge aspect of, uh, making crypto more accessible. Uh, I, I was, can I add on top of what AJ is speaking about? Because like, yeah. You know, Franklin Templeton is a user of the network, right? It's super important for us in when you're talking about the cost. And if we're talking about taking something like Benji, um, which is a, you know, interest bearing security, which is, you know, kind of different, clearly different than what the current constructs are, the stable coins that are permeated through the um, the digital asset ecosystem, it, you know, to, to help that move around. Those costs are costs for Franklin Templeton, right? Paying those fees to use the record keeping system. And so, yeah, your efforts, and we applaud. I was looking for a little button here to hit the clap sign here. We super applaud that because that's a cost of input for us. Yeah. And it's going to be a cost of input for anybody who uses the record keeping system. Piling on top of the scalability, those are exactly the conversations that we have with the regulators to, to let them understand about when we're doing our due diligence about building in these networks, it has to be scalable, it has to be resilient, it has to be always um, with the idea that we're looking to protect our savers who use these vehicles. So both of those things, again, applaud to uh, to the team for making that happen because that's exactly, we are a customer and a user, we will we will represent future um, all the different users that you have. And so, you know, thanks for doing all that hard work on that. And that's why we're super excited about getting to today where we're launching, uh, where we both have confidence in each other in that outcome. Yeah, you know, just to echo that point, first of all, thank you for the kind words. Fee, low fees environments unlock so many things, right? Because when you think about an interest bearing product, you know, basis points matter, right? And that's, you know, how people look at sort of where they park their cash or where they want to sort of place money in a safe haven. And, you know, the ability to ensure that we can keep fees low is is really, like you said, is a, is a major input. And what we're seeing is so many different cool, you know, 
microtransactions or you know payments to friends or all these different things um, really get unlocked with low fees in a way that they weren't just feasible and they weren't feasible in decentralized technologies, you know, even, even frankly, like a year and a half ago. Well, and it, 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 we see that live in Benji because the account minimums are so much lower than what they would be in a, in a product that's riding on other rails where the costs are so high, the, you know, the application to supply financial services to the previously unbanked because, you know, they just don't have enough money to, for financial service firms to to supply a service to them these are all the big unlocks by doing that great work that you guys have been doing to get the fees down and the scalability up thanks for the kind words and you know one of the things i think that's been most impressive for me about uh, what you guys have been doing with benji is the constant product updates right you guys have enabled peer-to-peer -peer transfers you've enabled usdc conversions so now more than ever it's easier to to do these things i remember a year ago, we were discussing you guys bring it to market, those features, and you guys have done it. So I feel like that echoes sort of your commitment um, to that. Uh, can you well, and I, can I, yeah, I want to give yeah. a shout out, not just to, I mean, yes, we've been doing hard work on that. We've had some foresight to do that. But for all of the criticism that regulators get, it has been regulators getting to that place and they being persistent with open ears about those possibilities and how... Uh, the networks provide, you know, great environments for these outcomes. I, I want to give a shout out to them because quite frankly, they don't always get a shout out, but it's, it's quite <laughs> frankly because, because they have gotten to the place where they understand that. And I think that, I mean, that's obviously bodes well for, for ARB going forward because um, now uh, that hurdle has been, has been crossed quite frankly. Shout out to the regulators. I love it. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> Uh, uh, I, and I guess AJ building off that, like, uh, now that's easier more than ever to do those conversions, especially using USDC, uh, which is what a lot of people on Arbitrum, uh, use our, our volumes are very high across the stable coin landscape. Uh, could you share more about some of those activity metrics on Arbitrum? How might users or projects or DAOs benefit from being able to tap into Benji? Yeah, definitely. So just to put some context to some numbers and metrics, um, this, you know, Arbitrum has about four and a half billion dollars in stable coins currently on the platform, which is, um, I think Ethereum and Tron are, are the clear leaders in those across, you know, USDC and, and USDT respectively. Um, and then I think Arbitrum ranks fourth right behind Binance's network. So really like, you know, the forefront of adoption of stable coin usage, um, it's actually, other than Ethereum, the only network that has more than one and a half billion of both USDC and USDT, which I think shows an interesting sort of diversification amongst different user bases as well. One of the things that I think makes Arbitrum unique is the DeFi activity that occurs on Arbitrum compared to other networks. Arbitrum, in many ways, is the home of purpose trading. We see that a lot of derivatives action. Um, swapping, I think Arbitrum had its best week this week. A lot of it were on price volatility for cryptocurrencies, but about seven and a half billion dollars in trading over the last seven days occurred on the Arbitrum network, which which is a massive number. And what's really exciting about that is it means that um, as a product, there's a lot of different paths for integration other than just holding, right? So you can have, you know, DAOs that hold significant treasuries that are looking for treasury diversification. This is something the Arbitrum DAO I know has been excited to look at generally. You have assets that can integrate it as collateral into, into products that they offer, whether that's a lending product or a various product. So you have a lot of different, very interesting and integrated ways in which the product can sort of permeate throughout the Arbitrum ecosystem. And one thing that I know that is unique to, I would say, you know, DeFi and cryptocurrency based economies is when there's yield, people move quickly compared to, um, I would say, tourism markets, which might have more time to react. I think crypto is very efficient and effective at this. And I'm really excited to see sort of as this product, you know, gets, gets released, like how do people think about this now as, you know, a product being issued by, you know, a major global financial institution. Um, so obviously there's a trust factor and there's also, um, people are excited about the ability to integrate these kind of things into the product. So I'm really excited to sort of see, but that's that kind of envisioning it playing out. Obviously I'm sure people are going to hold the asset for, for savings, et cetera. But I also want to see, you know, how we can integrate it more 
into a broader, you know, seamless economy in ways that, you know, might have been impossible in traditional finance? Well, you know, I'm going to, I'm not an investment advisor and um, I'm not offering investment advice in this conversation. Neither am I. Right. But but, but what I, but, you know, for sure, we know that money funds are used as a kind of a, as a store, there's, there's assets you need to protect. You can put them in money funds. You know, people have long-term investment objectives. They should be positioning themselves in places where there's, you know, attractive risk adjusted returns. You know, a money fund is a part of the liquidity stack for investors, for institutions, and for individuals. Um, and so that's why we're excited because we have seen money funds used in the transactional economy for a long period of time. I, I think I think one of the innovations Franklin brought to money funds years ago was the ability to write checks against your money fund, um, debit cards. And so now with this new ecosystem, there's lots of different possibilities in this transferability uh, permissions that, that unlock those things. And so, you know, it's just part of money. You, you know, you guys went to your economics class, you probably know, maybe you did, I, I shouldn't assume that but you know money uh money funds are part money okay well money supply right uh the fed calculates money supply m2 includes money funds right for that very reason so they're like a type of money and we're just excited about how we can continue to reinvent money and how savers can um can you know like i said large and small and unbanked can can unlock opportunities because of the deployment of these technologies uh as we keep looking forward. Yeah, you know, the discussion about money is really interesting. I I remember, you know, a year or so back, a little bit more than a year ago, we had this whole, uh, this whole crisis around banks having deposits versus a money fund, right? Could you walk us through that, Roger, and, you know, how the importance of having assets in a money fund is compared to something like a bank, and especially during the SBV timeframe? Yeah, that was a really crazy time period, wasn't it? Um, it, yeah. There's lots of different learnings from that, but there's, I, I, I think that, you know, really f coming out of the global financial crisis, which was now, gosh, I'm thinking that there was like, a, I mean, how many years ago was that? 15 plus years ago, right? What we kept, the, the global central banks kept um, supplying kind of easy monetary policy into the system. And that really, that happens because they keep their short-term interest rates at zero, quite frankly. And in that environment, uh, money funds, because money funds just simply reflect the um, interest earned on T-bills that are part of the curve, uh, was was suppressed for a long period of time. And so when people are thinking, well, where do I put my money? You know, what kind of place do I safeguard that? You know, I think they were just really open to the to the outreach from, you know, from banks who who are in that business all the time. But literally, banks and money funds have sat side by side um, in the the economy for decades, uh, with different purposes on each one of them. Uh, a mutual fund, which represents the wrapper around a money fund, is an entirely fully collateralized, hundred percent collateralized um, vehicle. Um, banks operate in a different model. Um, you know, they take in a dollar and they go invest it somewhere, um, and you expect to get your you know, dollar back when you take your deposits out, but they, they run a highly leveraged business. And I think that's what we saw unfold when the confidence in Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic began to evaporate, that uh, suddenly all the money is coming out and now there is not enough money um, for everybody to get it. And as a result, um, you know, bad outcomes uh, start unfolding. That's generally not the case in, um, in money funds um, because of the fully collateralization uh, aspect of them. I'm not, I'm not saying there hasn't been bumps in the road in money funds over the past decades. Uh, the reserve fund was a product that broke the buck in the global financial crisis. But I think it really highlighted it really highlighted to I think to the to the digital asset community in general who were being banked and didn't have the same kind of history and understanding of the number of products that they could line up into their liquidity stack that would also include money funds as a protective um, place to keep money as well. So it's about diversifying. And I'm going to apply that going forward because, quite frankly, I think we see the current stable constructs in the same way. They, they kind of look like banks, right? They say, we'll take a dollar in. We'll give you that dollar back, but we're going to go earn something on that dollar, and then us, the stablecoin operator, that's how we're going to make money. 
Well, we think, you know, Benji comes right alongside of that construct, just as money funds have come along banks and allow more option, more opportunity, more collaboration um, in both of those. So we don't see it as an either or situation. We see them working complementary, quite frankly, um, in the ecosystem going forward. There's going to be times where you're going to need the, the, the ease of using a stable coin is going to be great, but you want to shift money quickly into earning overnight interest um, and then shift back. These are the functionalities that we think are super important that this is about networks and tying. It's not about competing against one another. It's about growing opportunities because you're networking together. So I actually see a future where uh, stable coins and Benji actually, you know, integrate and network together to help increase the outcomes for, uh, for the users of both of those products. Yeah, no, that's, that's really cool. And I think like, coming back to that, I feel like that's the need for the product like this, right? I was, I was traveling at the time when this, all this stuff was happening. I had a couple of startup friends I was going with. They were worried because they had their money in SVV. And I feel like being able to tap into Benji or funds like this for a startup is just tremendous since it, it, it kind of takes all the risk away and also the on arbitrum, which is very cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share another thing that we learned about SVB and, and First Republic. Um, and this will be my, my second and last kind of shout out to the regulators. Sure. We have this, this, all this technology is super great and we see massive utility going forward. We've increased the velocity of outcomes. I think that's what you're talking about when you're talking about scalability of ARB, right? Building the scalability of ARB, you're increasing the ability to do lots of things. Well, if, you know, going back to the global financial crisis, and I'm, by the way, this morning, I'm coming from Park Avenue here in New York City. And I remember a time when there was Bear Stearns right down the street. Um, and there were other financial institutions right here in Midtown. Those financial institutions, you know, sadly, are, no longer exist uh, because of the global financial crisis. The velocity of the outcome during the global financial crisis kind of um, unfolded over a matter of weeks and months even, quite frankly. Yet the outcomes that occurred in um, – with Silicon Valley Bank was a very condensed time frame, right? Now we have social media, we have information spreading quite quickly that undermined the confidence that, you know, of Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic. And as a result, um, what I'm what I'm posing is the, there's both positive externalities, and we think there's massive positive externalities that exist by deploying these these technologies, but for sure the regulators are aware of the negative externalities too. And so while we've built and we're pacing the idea that they're, they're absolutely charged with doing everything they can to build an environment that avoids the negative externalities is part of what they do. And so I think sometimes we're super impatient about their pace of things, but for sure, we just hearken back to the global financial crisis and realize we don't want to build things that unwind the system faster should it come about. We want to make it more resilient, quite frankly. And so um, that's my last kind of shout out to the regulators about that, because their concerns are not the same concerns that we have. They're trying to protect the system and they see the outcomes. The technology having these massive benefits, but they want to make sure they're punching through what may be the risks that might result in a negative externality. Yeah, and you know, I think I also wanted to give a shout out to you guys, Franklin Templeton, because I think you've been at the forefront of embracing blockchain technology, working with the regulators hand in hand. Um, I know we touched a little bit about it, how you like leadership has been promoting that, but I also want to talk about how's culture been promoting that innovation. You know, how's the leadership? You know, you've been setting also as the head of digital assets been promoting that. Uh, NFT. Um, culture is so very, very, very important in all organizations. And I, I think what we've done is just created a culture of trying something, right? We're, I say we're in the business of Franklin Templeton in the business of trust. We're also in the business of taking risk. Um, and as an enterprise, we have to take risk with eyes forward. Uh, we want to be able to um, assess risks appropriately. Um, and that's kind of what we've been doing just in this space. And when you set that culture and you give people the opportunity to experiment um, and to try things, I mean, success is only built on a whole series of failures, quite frankly, right? You, we've heard that phrase before and, and we've experienced that ourselves. But uh, I think the culture of persistence, um, risk taking and um, 
opening yourself up to new possibilities. So often in life, behavior patterns of humans is I'm going to do the same thing today that I did yesterday. I'm going to walk the same way to work. I'm going to get the same drink at my favorite coffee spot. I'm going to do the same behaviors. But it's when you decide to take a turn left or right, find a new direction in life and things. And I think that's the culture that we've created. That's certainly the culture um, that we have as a team. It's it's a, It's amazing to Probably a year and a half ago, inside of the, our organization, we have something that's called our Digital Universe Exploration Call, and it was really probably a dozen of us just like, there's not supposed to be any outcomes from the meeting. We're not trying to create another list of things for people to do. It's just like, hey, where's the community of talking about ideas? That that has grown to hundreds of people who show up on that, right? You have to open the opportunity. You have to give people permission to do new things. And that really sets, it's not because you tell people that, it's because you lead by example in doing that and they follow because they feel like they have permission. So I think culture is so very important in all organizations, even inside of places where, while keeping established the culture of trust that we have to have, because that's certainly what we do all the time um, and that's our core business. So you have to kind of be able to weave both things. Um, so it's been a great ride. I, I, you know, I'm not a young person, um, but it, it, I think one of the things we've done is pair this wisdom of being involved over a long period of time and um, that's fed into our persistence and perseverance and uh, hopefully, you know, keeps us around for another 76 years like we have been so far. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thanks for, thanks for the compliments on that, by the way, Luke. Yeah, no, of course, of course. Uh, we are impressed with what you guys are doing. Um, on the topic of innovation, AJ, I wanted to ask you, um, how has Arbitrum sort of been developing products that might make sense for financial institutions? And there's a lot of things going up in the Dow, Stylus, Orbit Chains. How, yeah, could you elaborate more on that? Yeah, it's a multifaceted question. I'll, I'll do my best to answer it. So I th I think that um, there's really two dimensions to this. There's a technical and then there's, um, you know, almost like a social slash ecosystem component to this. So. From a technical perspective, I think what we've been trying to do with Arbitrum is really uh, provide the flexibility that different financial institutions need for different products. So, you know, examples of this are um, obviously we have the public networks where, you know, certain, you know, actors can use. Then there's people who, for whatever reason, whether it's regulatory, whether it's, you know, um, product focused, they don't want to be on a public chain. So we built a stack that's very modular that people can you know, use in many different ways, including choosing to launch their own blockchain. And if they want to incorporate things like privacy into their blockchain, like that is an option too. So we spent a lot of the um, time and cycles making sure that the product is flexible to serve the needs of really everyone who wants to participate in the industry as a whole, right? So, um, you know, yes, even yesterday we had an example. Um, you can now launch an Arbitrum Orbit chain, which is like your own instantiation of Arbitrum, not the public one, using, you know, like USDC as a stable coin, um, as the gas token. And there was a lot of demand for something like that because there's no taxes associated with transaction fees like you might have with ETH and there is, you know, compliance that you can have built in. To, so like, you know, we've been focusing on trying to make sure that the experience of what, um, financial institutions need to come on board is easy. And, you know, Roger, Franklin has any asks from us, like definitely send them across because this is really important feedback for us. We don't want to just be building just for crypto native projects, even though I think it's absolutely important that they are at the forefront of innovation. But we do want to make sure that the product is something that can be accessible and usable by many. And then in terms of things that like, for example, the Arbitrum DAO is doing, um, with the foundation work that they're doing and participants in the ecosystem, I think it's like, it's amazing that you have things like, you know, DAOs that are looking to diversify treasuries and buy money market funds. And I think it's, you know, historically DAOs have been like just holding their own token and they've had a ton of volatility in terms of their operating budgets. And I think what you're seeing is the early stages of maturation where, you know, people recognize that diversification in, into money market funds, for example, is not like selling a token and, you know, quote unquote, like exit liquidity. It's, it's prudent management for a business operation, whether that business operation is centralized or decentralized to make sure that they can have the capital that they need to re have their budgets maintained for their operational efficiencies. Right? So I think 
some of those organizations live on chain. And I think like Franklin Templeton and the Benji product obviously are, you know, great conduits for this maturation and sophistication of what we're starting to see with, you know, decentralized organizations that have control over these protocols. So that's like a really, really exciting thing for me um, in terms of where I think this innovation can go, who the, the early adopters on chain of, of these products will be. I'll, I, I, can I add on top of that? Cause I think that maturation word is just spot on. And when, you know, when we, in our, you know, business of offering advice on assets and, you know, look at assets, it's looking at the totality of what the kind of the issuing um, entity is. And I know that we're not talking about, you know, it's different here than, it, than being a company that's issuing a security or you're offering a loan, but no doubt institutional investors who are, who we are um, interacting with when they're trying to understand these things, they want to see that maturation of process, right? They don't want to see, they want to know that if they're investing their money on behalf of their um their constituents and they're doing their fiduciary responsibility that they're doing something with real people who are acting like real grownups, quite frankly. Um, and they're not just, you know, putting all the, all their, their risk in one type of asset and then, you know, not being there because quite frankly, these environments need to be resilient and for, for a long, long, long time. Right. And so uh, that's just part of the story when there is maturation in the process, then that attracts more, mature money, quite frankly. And, you know, that mature money, quite frankly, is very, very, very sizable. Well, yeah, that's a, it's a very large market out there. Uh, that's for sure. Cool. This is really awesome. This gives perspectives. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things I wanted to also uh, ask was like, we see so many, you know, Rust C++ developers out there. And I think, sure, Franklin Templeton, has a lot, a huge engineering team that's you know dedicated to that. But at the same time, we've only seen you know twenty thousand Solidity developers. Um, AJ, could you share maybe a bit about like Stylus and how that might yeah. be able to? I should have touched yeah. on that in the yeah. last question. I apologize. No worries. So historically, you know, you've had people who want to develop on blockchains have had to um, make trade offs that you might not see in traditional uh, software environments, right? So you want to work within the ethereum ecosystem you have to build on the ethereum virtual machine the evm the programming language that people tend to use most is like solidity because it compiles the evm um, or if you were building on like solana for example you would be using you know a solana defined version of rust um, which is you know close to Rust but a little bit different we think that um you know, what we do at Arbitrum and Off-Chain Labs, when we build this technology is we're scaling across three dimensions. We want to have prices go down. We want to have scalability go up. And we also want to be able to scale the developer experience. So we've historically done the first two well. We spoke about it earlier about, you know, multiple orders of magnitude decreasing costs, orders of magnitude increasing throughput. What Stylus does and um, the Arbitrum DAO is... I think either in the process of voting on it or it's completed the vote and it's going to be implemented on September 3rd. I think it's still vote dependent. Um, it actually scales that developer experience. So um, historically, if you wanted to build on Arbitrum, you know, as of today, you know, until September or whenever this podcast goes out, um, you have to build in the EVM. And a lot of developers are good with that and they're fine with that. But a lot of organizations, particularly in traditional finance and also in the gaming world, they use other libraries and they have other, you know, languages that their that their engineers understand that they know. And we want to be able to meet them where they are. So what does Stylus do? Stylus is an upgrade to the Arbitrum tech stack, which essentially says, if you want to continue to use just the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine, there is no impact on that experience. You can do exactly what you've historically done. There will be no you know, none of your softwares, you know, uh, or contracts is going to be outdated. But we are adding support for additional programming languages that can fully interoperate with the EVM. So we've added support already for Rust, C, and C++. You know, I hope other developers will take sort of the SDK to add support for additional programming languages. You know, maybe some crypto native ones like Moo, for example, where you see SUI and Aptos are using. And Arbitrum will become the first environment where all of these programming languages can exist and interoperate with each other 
um, without having to compromise on, do I want to build within that ecosystem or do I want to use that programming language? Now you can have both. And the really cool thing is, is that all of this retains its security and that it derives from Ethereum. So even though Ethereum, for example, does not have the ability to support programming languages written in Rust, Arbitrum built on top of Ethereum can take that code and still have the proving to Ethereum work through a very complicated system that we've developed. Again, beyond the scope of a former real estate lawyer and the, the uh, you know, Roger and you, Luke, no offense guys, but I, you know, our, you know, our brilliant engineering team has been prioritizing building this, right? So um, that is, I think, is huge, huge zero to one moment for blockchain technology because you know, you can just do what you want and build it on Arbitrum. You don't have to think about, oh, I want to launch this in Rust, or I have to rewrite this code and see. It just works, and you can take full advantage of the liquidity of Ethereum, the interoperability of Ethereum, um, all while still maintaining, you know, what what works for you. Yeah, I think that's, um, you know, more feedback from you, Roger. Things that you'd like to see us do, we'd be happy to incorporate that. And but that's just one of the things I think we've been seeing in the space and. Uh, definitely trying to build for the future. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'll I'll echo on top of that. And you're right; that's that's way beyond the purview of uh, of a uh, of a person who's involved in you know explaining money market funds to people. But what I can say um, is the Franklin Templeton development team, you know, was able to uh, to really work well with our um, team and getting to this place. So that's a, I mean that's another thing when we evaluate. You know, networks in general, you know, the ability for things to get built, quite frankly, has to be um, easy or easier, let's just say. Um, none of this is really easy stuff, but the bottom line is, is we've had a great experience um, with the team. It's mostly been sharing our learnings and, and uh, pulling through our regulatory friends to get to this place that we've gotten to today. But, um, you know, I can echo the... Uh, you know, working in the environment is something that, uh, that, uh, you know, that we were, we've enjoyed that process of working with the team to get to that place. I just say that. Yeah. Uh, you guys have an incredible team. I've spoken to Mike Beer plenty of times and he's a very smart, uh, leader of that. Uh, are there any future updates that, or product features that you could share with us today or, you know, what's the road look like for uh, going forward for FT? No, I mean, we're pretty transparent, you know, being a public security, we can't really tell things that don't exist. We can't like say, oh, this is the things that we're, we're working at. But for sure, the things that have unfolded um, have been a, a product of a lot of ideas that we've had for a period of time and just deploying them coming forward. I mean, I think in, in our in our ideal world, we would get to a place where Benji would act like a stable coin um, and uh, but we are a security. There is, um, we know, we have to know our customer. We have to go through, you know, the, the AML KYC process is important. Um, that's just part of what we do, but we like, we like Benji to, to work like a, a stable coin, just with the idea that in this macroeconomic environment, you know, you get 5% yield. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, not not trying to compete versus the stable coins, but actually complement what the uses are for both of them, quite frankly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've used the Benji platform and I've appreciated, you know, the updates I get from it on a constant basis. And also I would say like the, the app's pretty great. Like it's seamless, right? And it's like when I always thought about how like the inroads with traditional finance and blockchain work, the current constructs are, are difficult, I will admit. And, you know, having this app that, you know, takes it away, abstracts that away, but also, you know, settles things behind the scenes to Arbitrum among other blockchains is a, uh, is special. I think that's that's how it should be done. Um, so yeah. Well, for sure, for sure, we like the innovation that um, you know Roger can send Luke something. Can can we can um, we can transfer something of value, and you know Luke, you don't have to go take that money and go put it into an investment product, right? It actually happens. You're you're in the investment product as it happens. That's you know moving money faster. Quite frankly, um, is is you know part of kind of the objectives that we're working with and looking to find partners that allow us to to make that real seamless uh, for users because ultimately it's about the user experience, right? If users users have to find value and utility um, in what they 
in the products that they consume. And so those objectives are in our site. And we, we thank ARB for, for working with us and uh, getting to this place that we've come to today. So we look forward to the continued innovation and projects moving forward. Yeah, no, we want to be strong partners with you guys. It definitely feels like a lot of our thoughts align in that respect. Uh, okay, cool. I guess we're nearing the hour. Just one final question for AJ. You know, is there anything exciting that you want to share today uh, to cap it off about Arbitrum? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of exciting things. So Stylus, we talked on, you know, Bold and Time Boost or other big technical innovations that are coming in the next you know, one to two months. The thing I would say and that's relevant, I think, to me into this conversation is historically people have looked at the Arbitrum ecosystem as you know, pioneers within the crypto native community and the crypto ecosystem. And I think that what is amazing about what's happening here with Franklin Templeton and you know, other partnerships that have happened within the Rob Arbitrum ecosystem, like you know, Robin Hood and you know, and others is we get into this again, we use this word again, maturation of, of like traditional finance, fintech, meeting blockchain technology to provide a better user experience for everyone's customers. And I'm extremely excited about this. I think, you know, Rome is not built in a day, but having these worlds marry is just so cool. You know, as somebody who, for you know, has been historically a customer of products like money market funds and traditional worlds, but you know, believes in decentralization and sovereignty and the ability to have control over my assets, you know, and I like on the blockchain. It's just amazing to see. It's coming even honestly, I think in some ways faster than I expected. Um, you know, the work you guys have been doing for years is what sets today's announcement. It's not, again, like I said, rum built in a day. So I think that's the thing that's most exciting about the Arbitrum ecosystem and is this elevation that we're starting to see um, across, you know, traditional finance, across gaming with major gaming studios being excited, across, you know, culture. And it's just, it's really cool to see, I think, the elevation of of what blockchain technology can bring to the world beyond sort of what we see within a crypto native environment. I, I agree with that. Uh, and I think, you know, it's, a, it's been so impressive to see the outcomes and things that have developed in such a short time span. Um, and yeah, it's it's partners like yourself that make it possible. So thank you, Roger. Thank you, AJ, for coming to this. Uh, we really appreciate it and uh, look forward to it. Continuing. Yeah, thanks, guys.